Welcome to another episode of The Rocks of Utah. My name is Benjamin Berger, and in this video, we're gonna be exploring one of the most iconic rock formations in Utah, the Jurassic Entrada Sandstone. I'm here just outside of Moab, Utah, in Arches National Park. Uh, home to the largest and highest concentration of natural bridges and arches uh, in the world. This arch behind me is undoubtedly one of the most famous. It's called Delicate Arch and it stands 18 meters high with 14 uh, meter uh, span underneath the arch. So this arch has come to symbolize the landscape of Utah with these orange sandstones, this orange landscape contrasted with the blue sky. It's unlike any other place in the world. Arches National Park is over three times the size of Manhattan Island in New York City, and it features spectacular exposures of the Jurassic Entrada sandstone, uh, which is the primary arch-forming sandstone around Moab and within the boundaries of Arches National Park. Now, not all of um, the arches in Utah are actually formed by the Entrada sandstone. Um, many are formed by the Permian uh, Cutler group, um, such as the Oregon Rock Formation. Uh, the Cedar Mesa sandstone forms a lot of uh, uh, arches, uh, as well as the Navajo, the Wingate, and the Nugget Formations all form um, arches like these. So the uh, the, the uh, Jurassic Entrada Formation is the one that really forms a lot of the arches around Arches National Monument. Now the Jurassic Entrada Sandstone here in Arches National Park has a very serendipitous geological history that really promoted the formation of natural arches and bridges. So the Jurassic Entrada Sandstone was deposited 180 million years ago and it represents layers of sand that were deposited uh, in Aeolian sand dunes. And there was a great sand sea that existed here during the Jurassic, during this period of time uh, here in Utah. So one of the cool things about the Entrada Sandstone is you can see how the sand laid down, uh, was laid down in these sand dunes. So you can see these sedimentary structures, these really widespread cross trough beds is what we call them. And these are very indicative of Aeolian deposits, deposits of sand that were laid down in sand dunes. So you see, you can see how the sand was dipping off of the sand dunes and piling up and it forms these little layers. And the difference between these little layers is slight differences in the type of class, the type of sand grain. So sometimes it might be a little bit more finer grained and other times a little bit more coarser grained. And that's what gives this wonderful, beautiful banding pattern that you see in the Entrada sandstone. Now occasionally there would be marine intrusions of the ocean and they would make their way southward into this area um, as transgressions of the, of the ocean. And these sediments uh, were mud flats. They were or carbonate rich uh, rocks in the Jurassic. And these layers formed mudstones and limestones and softer uh, sedimentary layers. So the Jurassic Entrada sandstone is deposited on top of a softer unit, uh, a mudstone called the, uh, the Carmel Formation. Um, and then it's capped by another soft unit, the, the Curtis or the Somerville. Um, and, and that's capped by the, um, the Jurassic Morrison Formation, uh, which caps us. And those are composed of uh, softer mudstones. So here we are at the, at the base of the Entrada Sandstone, which is up here. And this is the Carmel Formation. It's kind of sandy in this area, and it's known as the Dewey Bridge member of the Carmel Sandstone. It has more calcium carbonate in it, and so it, it uh, erodes. And we can see there's like a little thin mudstone right in here. And that's what's eroding out. So I'm in one of these 
alcoves that eventually might become an arch. And uh, if you look up here in, uh, in this area, we have like a layer of some mud that's interbedded into the Entrada sandstone. And what's neat about this is that that mud is going to erode out faster. So it's cutting in the overhanging uh, sandstone. And as that cuts in, it's going to form this big arch here. So in here we have these little holes that are all along the sandstone here. Um, and these are caused by chemical weathering. So what it is is these holes that are in here, these little cavities, these little mini tiny little arches and natural bridges are formed because what's holding the sandstone together is a glue called calcite. Calcite is composed of calcium, carbon, and oxygen. And it's the glue that's holding everything together. But calcium carbonate, also known as uh, calcite in mineral form, when rain comes down, when we have these infrequent rains here in Utah, that rain is slightly acidic and it reacts to the carbonate glue and it basically starts to erode. It, it starts to dissolve some of that calcite uh, forming carbonic acid. That slightly acid rainwater that's coming down and some snow as well. It basically starts to work on those little cavities and once you get a little cavity like this opening up that rain will continue to kind of open and expand that out. And that's all caused by chemical weathering of dissolving out the calcium carbonate. It's the same process that forms caverns and caves. But here since we have a sandstone that's composed of calcium carbonate it's making these weird sort of great little little arches and bridges and holes and nooks all throughout the Entrada sandstone. So it's really kind of a special type of weathering. So one of the most important principles in geology is understanding how the two different types of ways that, uh, that rocks are deformed or the way that rocks break and uh, when, when stress is applied to them. Now some rocks behave like a, a lump of clay, uh, and this is called ductile deformation. So if you hit the clay with a rock hammer, it just deforms to the end of the rock hammer. So this is ductile deformation. Uncooked lasagna noodles, uh, when I hit them with a rock hammer, they break into little pieces, and this is called brittle deformation. So this region around Moab is called the Paradox Basin and deep below the subsurface is, are, are thick layers of deeply buried salt. Now this, this salt um, basically kind of blobbed up, moved up, um, and that caused the overlying rock layers to kind of start to swell and buckle. Um, before they were actually buried really deep enough to become ductile. So here I have kind of a sandwich of the mudstone of the Carmel down here, which is a ductile zone of mud. Um, and then we have the Entrada form formation, which is these uncooked lasagna noodles. And then on top we have another clay layer, another mudstone, which is the Somerville or Curtis formations. So one of the things that happened was that typically rocks will get buried really deep underground and they'll all behave ductally. They'll all be, you know, start to bend and deform at the same rate. But what's interesting is because of the salt tectonics that was pushing up when, before these were buried very deeply, the sandstone behaved brittily. And so as that was coming up, it began to break through and you can start hearing the cracking of that sandstone in there. Mudstone of the overlying mud starts to erode away, you can see these fins forming where it had cracked because of the deformation. So here we have some of the fins that are in the Entrada sandstone. Um, and what you can see is how the sandstone has broken apart in these little pieces. And between those pieces, there's erosion that's going on. 
this cutting down between those plates. This is like the uncooked lasagna that has broken up and it's sort of each of those little pieces of the uncooked lasagna is poking up through the mudstones. So here we have some of these geological fins coming out, these sandstone fins that have been broken apart, pulled apart, and erosion has worked in between them. So making these big, thin, platy uh, sandstones that are just poking out of the landscape. So underneath us, we're standing on the, uh, the contact with the Carmel uh, formation, which erodes pretty easily. But these sandstones, they acted more brittly. They broke and they separated out and they formed these uh, wonderful erosional cracks that water was able to get down into and start to erode them, start to dissolve out that glue that holds them together. So they're these like wonderful monoliths out here in the desert. They're just this spectacular sandstone formations. So they're, they're just beautiful, beautiful rocks. And what's amazing is that this has created, you know, in a serendipitous geological providence where you had this salt deformation that caused the rocks when they were still brittle to start to break apart and make these fins. And that set up the weathering that we see in Arches National Park of all these wonderful Jurassic Entrada sandstones that break apart and begin to form these arches. So there's some fantastic petroglyphs, they're everywhere. But these are kind of neat because they're very late period. In fact, they're, they're after the introduction of horses. And so you can see there's some horses in these petroglyphs, which is really cool. There's also some little dogs that are following along um, and some bighorn sheep that you can see. Delicate arch is eroding by the same processes and eventually those thin sandstones that are holding up the arch will eventually thin to the point where the arch collapses. So it'll be a really sad day when the arch eventually collapses. So while it's standing, um, I recommend coming and visiting Arches National Park and uh, coming up and seeing Delicate Arch while it still stands.